So this series is entitled Luke Acts for Beginners, lesson number one. This is the introduction lesson to this series. Uh, each gospel writer had an audience and he had a purpose uh, in mind when producing the gospel record that he writes. The, uh, these, of course, naturally influenced the way that they presented the material in each of their books. For example, Matthew. Matthew is writing his book with primarily Jews in mind. His material is well structured with a series of narrative descriptions of Jesus' movements and ministry, along with a record of the various discourses that he had with different groups of people. In other words, if you read through Matthew, you'll get a narrative that'll say he went here, he did this, he went there, he did that, and then a long section where uh, uh, Matthew describes a discourse, conversations, discussions that Jesus has with different individuals. And once that's over, another narrative begins. He went here, he did this, he went there, he did that, whoops, and then another discourse with the Pharisees, with the priests, with the disciples. That's Matthew's approach. Very structured, very organized. Um, Matthew's gospel is an apologetic, meaning a defense, a defense effort to prove, according to scripture, that Jesus was the Messiah spoken of and promised by the prophets in the Old Testament. So that was his point. The point he was trying to make in, in the entire book, Jesus is the Messiah and no other. So this explains why he supports Jesus' actions and teachings and miracles with proof texts from the prophecies about the Messiah and what the Messiah would say and do. Uh, when you read Matthew, he'll say something and he'll say, as it was written. As it was written. In other words, he did this as it was written. What the prophet said he would do, well, here it is. This is where he did it. So he's, he's talking to the Jews. He's saying he's the Messiah according to the scriptures. So Matthew, therefore, constructs his eyewitness record using Jewish history and custom, genealogies, and he presents his arguments based on the fulfillment of prophecy concerning the Jewish Messiah. So if you want to know who is the Jewish Messiah and how do you prove he's the Jewish Messiah, read Matthew. Mark, on the other hand, his gospel is the shortest and one of the early inspired books produced somewhere 64 to 67 AD in the New Testament. Mark's purpose was to present Jesus as the divine Son of God based on what he did. So Mark spends very little time on background information or uh, theological speculation. He just gets right to the point that he wants to make and actually in his opening verse he introduces Jesus as the Son of God and then he goes on to describe his many miracles to prove his point. Matthew starts you know, genealogies, background. You, know, you get a lot of before Jesus makes an appearance. Mark right out of the box. Okay, this is Jesus. He's the Son of God. Let me show you, how, you know, why I believe that. Okay. So this short and direct method of presenting material appealed to the Roman mindset, not to the Jews. The Roman mindset and thus Mark's gospel was Gentile friendly. It was uncluttered with Jewish genealogies uh, or references to Old Testament prophets, which would have meant nothing to Gentiles reading his book. They didn't care. Although Mark's gospel is the shortest, it is the gospel record most copied from. Luke uses 350 verses taken from Mark. And, he described, and Mark describes the most miracles. There's a possibility of 35 miracles described in all the Gospels, and the short book of Mark uh, recounts 18 of those 35. And he does this in an effort to clearly and concisely present Jesus as the Son of God. That's his goal. Uh, I have a, a book on Mark and the subtitle of the book, it's, you know, it's the book of Mark, and the subtitle is The Urgent Gospel. The Urgent God. He was in a hurry to get to the point. Okay? So if you're ever teaching somebody, 
and you're thinking, I'd like to teach somebody, but I don't know which gospel should I begin with. Somebody new, somebody who doesn't have a lot of background information on Christianity, I would not recommend Matthew right away because you'd have to explain so much about Jewish history and Jewish prophecy. You know, you'd have to explain so much to someone who's new. I would suggest start with Mark, because Mark gets to the point in a hurry and you know, it's, 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 it's evangelistically friendly. I mean, you could convert somebody you know, using any of the Gospels, but if you had your choice to begin, I'd say start with Mark, follow with Matthew, then do Luke, finish with John, but I'll explain why later. Uh, let's talk about uh, John's gospel. We'll get to Luke in a minute. Now John's gospel was written when the difference between Jew and Gentile had largely disappeared. This is after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 AD. Matthew, Mark, Luke, they all write their gospels before 70 AD. John writes his gospel after 70 AD. The, you know, the, the Jews have been dispersed, the temple has been destroyed, the city has been knocked down. So he's writing from Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey, where false doctrines such as Gnosticism uh, were challenging the claims of Christianity. And so his purpose is to show that Jesus was both fully human and fully divine at the same time. And the reason for this was to counter Gnostic teaching that Jesus was either not fully human or was not fully divine, but he was only part of each at different times. Gnosticism coming from the word gnosis means knowledge. People began preaching a gospel that they thought was of a higher knowledge. They were saying, oh, don't believe in that. You know, Jesus, the Son of God, resurrection. Oh, no, 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 no. That's much too, you know, that's all mysticism. You know, we, we have a much higher, we have a much higher uh, gospel. We, ha we have much more refined gospel uh, to, to teach you. So John you know, uh, launches his gospel with this in mind. For example, uh, some of the Gnosticism, the divine element of his being, Jesus' being, they taught, uh, actually descended on him at baptism and it left him at the crucifixion. That's one of the Gnostic teachings. So John's purpose therefore uh, was to show that Jesus was fully divine as the Son of God and that salvation was found in him alone. He was fully divine, fully human. Again, another book that, uh, that I've done uh, the Gospel of John, the subtitle is Jesus the God-Man. Jesus the God-Man, because He was fully divine, fully human at the same time. So John does, you know, um, uh, does this thing by presenting a series of events where Jesus is displaying His divine glory by His inspired teaching or powerful miracles and then John describes the reaction of belief or disbelief by those who witness these things. And if you go through John, it's a, it's a constant cycle. Jesus does something, <clears throat> a miracle or something like that, and then John describes how people reacted to that miracle. Some believe, some disbelieve. Goes on, whoop, a, a section of teaching that Jesus does. And then you know, the reaction to that teaching. Some believe, some disbelieve. And he goes, you know, he, he follows this cycle all the way through in his book. So that's John. So then we get to Luke. And what I'd like to do is give you a timeline for Luke, since this is the introductory lesson, give you a little context here. Where, where did he write this? Why did he write this? Who is Luke? So both Matthew and John were chosen apostles and personally witnessed Jesus' baptism, His ministry, His death, His resurrection, and His ascension to heaven. And their record reflects this. Mark served as an early co-worker with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, but he left in order to return home before that missionary journey was complete. He was then mentioned by Barnabas, his, uh, mentored rather by his cousin Barnabas, after Paul refused to have him accompany them on the next journey. Uh, you know, the beautiful thing about the book of Acts, and we'll, we'll get there in a couple of months, is that it's so human. 
you see human beings acting like human beings. It's not some sort of mystical tour or something like that. You know, Paul and Barnabas and Mark, young Mark, they, they leave on the first missionary journey and they head out and they go, you know, they go here, they go there, and then they, they enter Asia Minor where they're really entering foreign territory, paganism, it's really getting dicey, and all of a sudden Mark, the youngest one, oops, he, he gets cold feet and he says, you know, I don't know, maybe, I, I don't, maybe I'm not cut out for this mission work stuff. And he turns around and he leaves them and he goes home. And Paul and Barnabas, they, you know, they continue. Now the thing that we know is that Mark was Barnabas' cousin. So they have a family relationship. So you know, Paul and Barnabas, they continue the first missionary journey. And then they say, you know what, we ought to go back and visit the churches that we planted and so they would go on our second missionary journey. And Barnabas says, yeah, okay, great, Let, let's bring Mark along. Little Marky, let's bring him along. And Paul says, no, 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 no. You know, the kid was afraid to go with us. There's no way I'm getting stranded. You know. And the Bible records that Paul and Barnabas, they have this argument, disagreement to the point where they said, OK, you go your way, you do the Lord's work over here and I'll go my way. And I'll... So Barnabas finds Mark and he brings him along. Again, we'll talk about that when we, when we go into Acts. Just the idea, it's so human. You see human nature right there in, in, in front of you. Now we know that Mark was eventually restored to Paul's good graces and eventually ended up serving as Peter, the apostle's secretary. And so Peter's gospel or Mark's gospel is largely what he wrote and organized concerning Peter's witness and experience with Jesus as an apostle. In other words, when you're reading Mark, what you're reading is Peter. You're reading Peter's experience through Mark's eyes. Well, in the same way, Luke was not one of the chosen apostles, but he came by his knowledge of the gospel and the details of Jesus' life and teachings by association with an apostle. In this case, the apostle Paul. So let's do a kind of a timeline here for Luke. In Luke's description of an event taking place in Antioch, Acts 11, 27 to 30, Luke uses grammar that suggests that he himself was present and describing a scene that he personally witnessed. That's how we find out a lot of information about where Luke was, because he says, you know, Paul and I went over here and then we did this. Well, that suggests that they were together in the same place and what, 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 what Paul was doing Luke was a witness of, because he said, we saw this, we did this, we went over here. This would mean that he himself was a Gentile convert, probably coming to Christ as a Christian, or as Christians went out from Jerusalem, preaching the gospel throughout Judea and further north on account of the persecution taking place in Jerusalem. So there was a persecution in Jerusalem, the Christians that were there, and that was the main center of Christianity at the beginning, they began to fan out, they began to spread out because of persecution. And they began sharing the gospel and you know, planting churches. And so Luke was a convert of that original, you know, that, that original push, if you wish. One of the places where a church was established was Antioch. Antioch, up in the north. This is where Luke lived. He lived in Antioch. We know about that, Acts eleven nineteen. 19. He, Luke, is referred to as a physician and a Gentile in Colossians chapter four, verses 10 to 14, and he could have received his medical training in Antioch because there was a famous medical school located there at that time. That's not in the Bible. You have to find that in history. But when you look at the history and you can put, you know, put the pieces together. Okay? So this would mean, think about that now. This would mean that a quarter of the New Testament was written by a Gentile convert to Christianity. Because Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and he also wrote the book of Acts. Two very long books take up a quarter of the New Testament. So how does he connect with Paul? Well, Luke, therefore, was a Gentile convert who was a member of the first mixed congregation, meaning Jew and Gentile, in Antioch. 
He was converted before Paul was recruited by Barnabas to go there and teach. The church was established in Antioch, things were going on. The, the apostles sent Barnab Barnabas goes there and sees the situation, realizes, whoa, we need somebody who has a Gentile background, somebody who's got some understanding about that, goes and finds Paul, brings Paul to Antioch, and together they begin teaching and coaching this particular church because it was a hybrid, it was new. Never was a church, there was no congregation where Gentiles and Jews were together. It was a special case in Antioch, needed special teaching, needed special experience, if you wish. So this means that he met Paul and received further teaching from him for an entire year while Paul was in Antioch and was present when Paul and Barnabas and Mark were sent out on their first missionary journey. Acts 13, right? The church lays hands on Paul and Barnabas. You know, the Spirit says, you know, separate uh, for me. Paul and Barnabas, they're separated. I, you know, they're sent off on their first missionary journey from Antioch and they bring Mark with them. Luke was a member of that church. He received the teaching from Paul and Barnabas. He knew what was going on. And so let's talk about Luke's ministry. The first glimpse that we have of Luke's ministry with Paul occurs in Acts 16.10, where he is with Paul in Troas, where the apostle receives a vision to go preach in Greece, in Macedonia. And this would be on the second missionary journey. We're talking around 49 AD here. This is one of those we passages where Luke's name is not mentioned, but as the author, his presence is assumed since he is describing events witnessed in the first person, plural. We saw this, we went there, we did this. Well, it means he was with Paul. Luke is also present and ministering to Paul during his imprisonment, his initial imprisonment in Caesarea after his return from his third missionary journey, where upon arrival at Jerusalem, you know, Paul is caught up in a mob, in a riot, in the temple, he's arrested, he's put in jail, 58 AD. Luke was there with him. More timeline. Luke also accompanies Paul on his dangerous journey to Rome. Remember, he, Paul appeals to Rome for his case. And the governor says, all right, you want to go to Rome to appeal your case? To Rome you'll go. And so he's sent, you know, he's given over to a centurion, he's given over to guards, and they take several ships and they make their way to Rome. And we know what happens, those of you who have read Acts, they're shipwrecked, they have all kinds of problems. Well, Luke is there you know, with them. So he accompanies Paul on this dangerous journey to Rome and trial before Caesar. We read about that in Acts 27. Now we're in 60, 62 AD. And Luke remains with Paul during this first imprisonment in Acts 28, 30 to 31. We read about that. Paul also mentions Luke one final time in 2 Timothy 4.11 during his second imprisonment awaiting his pending execution. A Little bit of ex explanation there. First time he's arrested in Jerusalem and through a series of trials, and finds himself appealing his case in Rome. Apparently, he appeals his case and he wins his freedom. And he's free for a couple of years. And during that time, he goes back and visits several of the churches that he had, you know, he had planned to go on to Spain. Remember, those of you who have read you know, Romans and Acts, he wanted to go on to Spain to preach the gospel in that area. But after his first imprisonment, he said, you know what, I think maybe I should go back and you know, strengthen the churches that we've already planted. And then a couple of years later, later there's a, a new persecution, a new uprising. He's caught up in this once again, recognized as a serious leader of this Christianity sect. The second imprisonment, he's put in jail, and this time, he doesn't get out. This time he's convicted and he's martyred um, in Rome. So when I'm talking about, you know, Paul mentions Luke one final time during his second imprisonment, this is what 
we're talking about. Paul and Luke knew that this was the end. Luke is the only remaining worker left to minister to Paul's needs while he is in prison in Rome, while he is waiting, uh, awaiting execution. Luke's gospel itself. So Luke had many first-hand resources to draw from in the writing of his gospel. As an early member of the church at Antioch, he was immersed in the first century preaching of the apostles and their disciples. Barnabas was there too. He, um, he was also taught by Paul for a year and accompanied him on several missionary journeys, hearing his preaching and teaching and witnessing the miracles. In addition to this, he spent years interacting with the Apostle Paul while he was in prison writing his many epistles. Do you think for a moment, and again, you have to go between the lines, Luke is ministering to Luke, uh, uh, Luke is ministering to Paul, Paul's in prison, Paul's writing his letters to the different churches from prison. Do you think maybe there might have been a conversation between Luke and Paul? These co-workers who had jointly planted these churches, who had dealt with the problems that the, you think maybe they might have had a conversation? I think so. I think so. So Luke also had a, 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 a working relationship not only with Paul and Barnabas, but also with John Mark, who was the writer of the gospel you know, from Peter's point of view. In Philemon 24 and in 2 Timothy 4.10, we note that both these men ministered to Paul while in prison and were present at his execution. Luke saw Paul being executed. So this background prepared Luke to write, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, of course, this prepared him to write a gospel account which was not based on his own eyewitness of Jesus' life, death, and burial, and resurrection, but on the eyewitness accounts of his contemporaries among the apostles, Peter and Paul, as well as the disciples of the apostles, Mark, and members of the early church in Jerusalem, Barnabas. So Luke states in his opening verses that his gospel is a compilation of several sources of information about Jesus, which he will carefully lay out in order to explain and reveal the truth of the gospel concerning Jesus Christ. He makes no bones about it. Remember I went through, this is what Matthew is about, this is what Mark is about, this is what John is about. But in none of those gospels do the authors actually say, this is what my gospel is about. You have to read it and you, know, you have to deduce it as you read. Oh, that's what his gospel is about. But Luke isn't like that. Luke, he right away, you know from the very beginning what it is he's trying to do. He sets it forth right away. So you, you know, you're absolutely sure when you read Luke's gospel, you know where you're going. You know where he's going. Now, most scholars agree that when the codex book form for the New Testament was produced, codex, uh, in those days, first century times, uh, the books or the writing material was on scrolls, you know, these rolled paper. Uh, but a new um, format, an upgrade, <laughs> scrolls two came out and it was called the codex form and it was the precursor to the modern book form. In other words, instead of rolled papers you know, that were glued together and then rolled into one, you started to have paper, pages, that were stacked one on top of another and then glued or, or bound. Well, that was referred to as the codex form. Well, when the codex form for the New Testament was produced, it placed the four gospels in the order of writing. You know, when you had a roll of paper, that was one thing, but when you've got pages, you had to, you know, when does this story stop and this story begin over here? So that's when the four gospels, well, which one should go first and which one should go second and which one should go third? So scholars believe it's the order of writing, not the order of importance. And so with this in mind, and again, when you're speculating about when things were written you know, 2,000 years ago, you, 
you know, there, it's not always, you, you can't get it to the month and the day, but generally, Matthew 60 to 64 AD, Mark 64 to 66, Luke 66 to 68, and as we say, John much later after the fall of Jerusalem, 80 AD. The theme of Luke, the theme of Luke is simple, an orderly account. I will make an orderly account, a step by step. This is what happened and this is what happened and then after this is what happened, an orderly account. So while other gospels have theological goals, Matthew, you know, Jesus is the Messiah. Mark, Jesus is the divine son of God. John, Jesus is both God and man. Those are theological objectives. Luke's main theme is not to show that Jesus is God, but that the Son of God lived among men in a historical setting, in a certain time and place. Whereas Matthew went to great lengths to support his premise that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah by providing numerous proof texts from the Old Testament prophets, Luke provides all kinds of historical markers, such as names of local kings and rulers, historical events, intimate interaction with disciples and friends, in order to situate the presence of Jesus not only in human history, but in human settings as well. Luke is very careful to let the reader know this happened during this time in history and also at this geographical location. Because he wants to make sure that his readers know that the story of Jesus is not some myth. It's not just some sort of you know, airy, spiritual story. It's a historical thing. It happened in history. That's why he says, you know, during the reign of this king, in this particular town, when this guy was the mayor, well, maybe not that far, but you know, he sets it in history. So Luke presents a well-structured narrative of Jesus' extraordinary birth and life and death and resurrection and ascension against the very ordinary setting of first century Jewish life in and around the areas of Jerusalem and the region of Galilee. So let's uh, take a look at an outline here. I'm not going to touch the uh, text this morning. We're going to we're going to do all this preparatory stuff first and then we'll jump into the text next week. So here's the outline. H.R. Lenski in his commentary provides the simplest outline that matches Luke's division of material. So this is how Luke sets it out. The beginning, well the beginning, his birth and the beginning of his time. Chapter 1, 1 to 338. Then Jesus' life in Galilee. We don't realize that most of the time Jesus' ministry was taking place in Galilee, up in the north. So chapter four all the way to, chapter, to the end of chapter nine, that's all about his ministry in Galilee. Then Jesus facing Jerusalem. What this is, is Luke recounts in order the, 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 um, the activity taking place as Jesus leaves the north and begins heading south to go to Jerusalem. And it's amazing all the things that take place on this particular journey. Because remember, they didn't take the train, they walked 75, 80 miles. And 75, 80 miles, not you know, Jesus and two guys and all right, okay, today we're really going to hump it. You know, we're going to do nine miles today, 10 miles, no. Uh, you ever see, um, you know, either a politician or somebody famous, you know, and they're, they're walking around. What's around them? Newspaper people, people taking pictures, people who, hey, look who's here, oh, so-and-so star, you know, Kevin Durant, you know, big basketball star. You think Kevin Durant could go to a mall, for example? You think he could go to Outlet Mall or he could go to a Quail Springs Mall, just walk around, buy himself some sneakers, and nobody pay attention? Are you kidding? Would it take five minutes? There'd be hundreds of people around him, right? Well, Jesus was, one of those people of that time. 
He could go nowhere publicly, especially you know, a year or so into his ministry. He, can go, he couldn't go anywhere without people. So it's from the north to the south with the disciples, with the apostles and the disciples and the crowd and the priests and the onlookers and the, the drive-by media. You know? <laughs> they were going from north to south. So Jesus facing Jerusalem is the story of that trip and what takes place. And then Jesus entering Jerusalem. Well, he didn't just go in for one day, right? He'd go in and do something and then he'd stay in Bethany and he'd go back in, he'd go back, you know. So Luke talks about the action that takes place when he goes to Jerusalem and then the consummation. The consummation, Luke devotes only two chapters to that, but of course it's the passion. Jesus, the suffering that he had, his trial, his death, his resurrection, all that. That's in part number five. So to summarize here, Luke writes a step-by-step -step account of Jesus' life that lays out the signs and events that preceded his birth. He follows with a precise historical account of his ministry leading up to his death resurrection, several descriptions of his interactions with disciples after his resurrection, and he finishes with a description of his ascension and a brief epilogue about the apostles after Jesus ascended into heaven. And all of this in a simple, straightforward style that helps the reader imagine the divine Son of God actually living among ordinary men at a particular time in human history. So <clears throat> this series on Luke that I'll be doing we'll have 13 lessons. Now think about that for a second. We've already burned one lesson today. We haven't even touched the text yet. So now we've got 12 lessons to cover <laughs> the text. And Luke is the second longest gospel at 24 chapters. Matthew is 28. So we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to drill down and examine every single event and teaching in Jesus' ministry contained in Luke. So what I'm going to try to do, therefore, is to address everything that Luke includes in his gospel. In other words, we're going to start at chapter one, verse one, and we're going to go down verse by verse. But I'm going to pay special attention to those things that are only found in Luke and not in the other gospels. Remember I said Luke, he took several hundred verses out of Mark, you know, because Luke, he's putting stuff together for his gospel. So we're going to kind of talk about briefly you know, each thing that happens, but I'm going to stop and go deeper into those things that are only found in Luke's gospel, but they're not found in Mark or Matthew. Okay? So in this way, we're going to be going through Luke's record section, excuse me, we're going to be going through Luke's record section by section with a line uh, by line comment on each, but we're going to concentrate our focus of study on the things that only Luke talks about, or perhaps what he has borrowed from only perhaps one other writer and kind of you know, developed a little further. Hopefully with this approach, we're going to cover the entire book with special emphasis on Luke's unique contribution. All of this completed, Lord willing, in 13 lessons. So next week, we're going to start and you have um, reading assignments, because we don't, normally if I'm doing a book, a short epistle, I'll read every single line. You know, I'll put it up on the, on the screen and we'll read every single line and we'll go through every single line. We won't have time to do that with Luke. So there'll be, okay, these next 15 lines here talks about this, I'll make a few comments, but I'm not going to read them because we won't have time to read them. So I'm going to let you read them. So you have homework and the homework is simply keep up with the reading. All right, so if you're in this class, if you choose to do this class, if you've done the reading, you'll know what I'm talking about when I make reference to it. So the first three chapters, 1-1 one, one to chapter three, verse 38, that'll be the uh, reading assignment for you. All right, that's it for this time. Hopefully we'll see you next time. God bless.